Weinberg is an associate professor at the Columbia University School of Social Work and faculty of the Columbia Population Research Center and Data Science Institute, where she co-chairs the Computational Social Science Working Group. She employs a transdisciplinary strategy to improve the characterization and measurement of racism, and in, and in examining the role of racism in the production of racial inequities in health. She's also a member of the American Medical Association's External Equity and Innovation Advisory Group and the RWJF, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Health Equity Collective. Dr. Cogburn's work also explores the potential of media and technology in creating and eradicating racism and racial inequities in health. She is the lead creator of A Thousand Cut Journey, an immersive virtual reality experience of racism that premiered at the 2018 Tribeca Film Festival. She is also the co-founder of the Justice Equity and Technology Laboratory. Um, Dr. Cogburn is the Chief Equity Officer and Knowledge Transfer Director, a new role of the Learning the Earth with Artificial Intelligence and Physics, LEAP, and NSF, National Science Foundation, Science and Technology Center. Dr. Cogburn uh, completed postdoctoral training at Harvard University in the Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholar Program and at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. She received her PhD in Education Psychology and MSW from the University of Michigan and her BA in Psychology from the University of Virginia. And last night we had a chance to eat um, where she was famished and I was famished, and you really get to know a person when you eat with them, <laughs> when they're hungry, just to let you know. And Dr. Cockburn, um, I met Dr. Cockburn by Zoom uh, because uh, one of my postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Nkemka uh, in, uh, in Yiwo, I asked her, do you know of a scholar who has some understanding around race and virtual reality, uh, in particular because of a of a grant opportunity that I, I needed support with. And uh, I called her up. She mentioned, yes, Courtney Hockburn. And I called her up and asked if she would join a venture that had um, sort of like Star Trek, no particular boundaries whatsoever beyond space, going beyond those places we'd never gone before. And she immediately agreed. Uh, we did not get the money. But we had so much fun planning that I had to have her <laughs> here for our lecture. Uh, it was so much fun working with you. And, do, and when I told Dr. Clayton, who has always been uh, um, uh, interested in what's going to happen for children in the future, um, you were the perfect choice. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. And I hope we will still have uh, many opportunities to play in a, in a holodeck space for the future. But um, I want to introduce to you and welcome Dr. Courtney Cockburn. Hello, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here with you. There's clearly so much magic in the room. Thank you to the performers um, and to the UPenn team uh, for, for welcoming me here to, to share some new ideas and thinking. Let me just get my slides up. Thank you. Uh, so we are all standing on the shoulders of, of giants and I am humbled and honored to have um, gotten to know more about uh, Dr. Clayton and the tremendous contributions you've made to Philadelphia and to black people and black youth uh, more broadly. Um, I have been uh, made aware that you're an art collector, so I put this piece on the first slide from Bisa Butler. Um, this is a quilt. It's made completely of fabric. It doesn't use any paint, and I thought it was such a uh, allegory for the intricacies and vibrancy of the, the ideas that I'm hoping to share with you today. Um, I tweeted this, I'm a tweeter, I like to tweet. Um, I tweeted this uh, uh, earlier in the month where I said, there's the space between imagination and the story we tell about the dream. We should let imagination linger longer. In story comes performance, claimed clarity, that in some ways blunts imagination because it is more convinced than the dream. 
So today I am dreaming with you. I'm not sharing something that is clear. I'm not sharing carefully crafted story or narrative. Today I'm asking questions, not offering answers. Today I'm sharing what is inspiring me and moving me into a new line of scholarship. I offer a reflection on where I've been and where I'm going. I am thinking with you. There is no story, only imagining. So the first section of my lecture today, I'll categorize in these three circles, documented in spite of anti-racism and technology. Blackness is documented. I've spent most of my career thinking about the ways in which to document threats to black well-being and health. I humbly draw on a broader tradition that has engaged in this work. I share this work from um, uh, Dr. Du Bois, uh, this work sort of using visual imagery to categorize and catalog the experiences of black people living in the United States. It was a innovative and radical approach. The methodologies, the content, the mode of uh, presentation, each represent a fundamental paradigm shift in how we understood black life. The authors of the texts cataloging this work said the politics of visuality and the very question of black visibility were central to Du Bois's thought. Blackness is in spite of. Black well-being and health exist in spite of existential, existential threats. Black girl magic, liberation, Black Lives Matter, abolition, anti-racism are all responses to white existential threats that oppress black people. These things manifest in magic and joy in spite of whiteness. Blackness is anti-racism. A portion of my work has started to think about how do I engage the problem of racism, not only document the threats, not only document black people's responses to those threats, but how do I hold whiteness accountable as a key source of existential threat to black well-being and health? I'm guided by the work of Toni Morrison and many others that I'll share today, where she says, my project is an effort to avert the critical gaze from the racial object to the racial subject, from the described and imagined to the describers and the imaginers. This is driven in large part by my personal and professional experience, as well as the empirical literature that documents white people don't understand racism. There's a big red asterisk here. Don't listen, willfully ignore, opt out of acknowledging, actively dismiss, reduced to a problem of the past, believe it's an exaggeration, don't feel comfortable relinquishing privilege, power, or status. I think specifically about white liberal audiences, those who claim to be the good white people. They believe in equity and justice. They just don't really understand it. It hasn't really had deep implications for their lives. And as such, that and other psychological and cognitive barriers get in the way of truly developing the level of understanding and engagement necessary to help shift this tide. In the words of Tom Nancy Coates, but for all of our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience that lodges brains, blocks airways, tips muscle, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must always remember the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. I believe that achieving racial justice requires that we understand racism. Not an understanding that emerges from intellectual exercise or even in the consumption or production of science but rather a visceral understanding that connects the spirit and body as much as reason. In doing this work, I created a Thousand Cut Journey along with the team at Stanford University. I wanted to create an experience that would allow the white liberal user to step into the shoes of a black man experiencing racism as a child, and as an adolescent, and as an adult. In the beginning, you see yourself in the mirror as a small brown boy. You wave, you're able to control the body. 
And then we then transport you into an elementary school classroom. You're sitting on the floor, you're able to stack and collect and throw the blocks that are in front of you. The kids in the classroom are saying things like, Michael, throw the fireball, Just throw the scary black fireball. Black is always the scariest. We're introducing the ways in which black children are encountering white racism very, very early in life. That these notions of black being bad exist in this collective narrative uh, from very young ages. We essentially goad you into throwing the blocks that are sitting in front of you. The other kids are throwing blocks as well. People usually throw the block at the kid that says, throw the scary black fireball. They usually aim right for his head. <laughs> when you do that, it triggers a response from a white female teacher who is just out of the shot here, who stands up and yells at you, Michael, you're being dangerous. You're gonna hurt someone. The other children don't get in trouble. You do. Now, this could be a story, a narrative that we created, but you know this is empirically grounded, uh -huh. right? Dr. Howard Stevens was in right here, right? We know the experiences of our youth in classrooms are very different than those of white youth. So we're taking that data and integrating it into a narrative, a virtual experience, that can perhaps help people engage differently than they read it on a page, than when they read it on a page. We use mirrors to help you reconnect with your black body you now see yourself as an adolescent. You're in your room in Brooklyn. You're walking around. Uh, you can throw a blast basketball. You get a phone call from your white friend who says, come downstairs. We're going to be late for the game. You go downstairs. Your mother's watching the news. And when she sees you, she says, you need to change. The police are looking for someone who's dressed similarly to you. You resist. Your friend says, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Your mother then says, don't forget what happened to your brother. So in this moment, we're representing layers of racism. What does it mean to be exposed to racism? What does it mean to live and navigate racist systems? A mother having to be vigilant about what her son is wearing, not only whether he's going to make it to the game on time, is another layer of having to grapple and deal with the realities of racism. The cluelessness of the white friend disregarding the significance of what a shirt can mean on the streets of Brooklyn is another representation of racism. Later in the scene, you're standing on the street, your neighbors are wishing you good luck at your game, and three officers pull up in a car, jump out, and tell you to get down on your knees and put your hands up. And we have you, the user, in the headset, get down on your knees and put your hands up if you're able to do so. They're yelling, they're cursing, the neighbors on the street are yelling, leave that boy alone, and suddenly the lights go out, and all you can hear is your mother's voice saying, just do what you have to do to get home alive. There's so much wrapped in that. And I can't tell you the number of times I've had people tell me the, the feelings of shame, embarrassment, of being watched, confusion. What did I do? I was just standing on the street. And now they are having to embody this experience in a very real way. In the third scene, you transition to adulthood. You're applying for a position at a firm. You walk up to the guy on the left uh, who blackens the way he speaks to you. Right? You're talking to the black guy. He's trying to be more cool. We've been there. The interviewer comes out and approaches the white guy and says, you must be our candidate from Yale. We're so excited to meet you. No, sir, I'm a proud graduate of Michigan State, he says. I went to the University of Michigan. I had to make him go to Michigan State. <laughs> the administrative assistant who's in the background says, actually, Michael's our candidate from Yale. And this screenshot is the first time that they turn and acknowledge your existence at all. He says, you don't mind if I take him back first, do you? Even though you were clearly the candidate he was most excited to meet. Later in this scene, you're standing in the bathroom with your partner who says, seems like you got a voicemail, listen to it. You pick up the phone and listen to the call. Thank you, Michael, you're an excellent candidate. We just don't think you're a good cultural fit for the organization. I wanted to give you a sense of what this looks like. We, we were talking about the possibility of bringing headsets and having you all go through the experience, but 
with COVID and all these things, that's very difficult to achieve. So I have some video clips to try and give you a sense of what this looks like. So we have my, my colleague Tobin here, who's the user in the headset. He's in full control of the avatar body. He can move the hands, the head, etc. We also really wanted to integrate interactivity. So we wanted you to use the body, get down on your hands, throw a basketball, pick up a phone, etc. This is the Mike, trailer. Look at me. Leave that boy alone. Well, I'm just, oh, this is scary. <laughs> he didn't do anything wrong. No, no, you can't even do this like that. That's against that. I should have a cartel. Sorry, just brush it off. You have now become Mike Sterling. Look at yourself in the mirror. So in this work, we're bridging uh, psychological, sociological research, lived experience with experts who have been thinking about social and behavioral applications of VR and then joining forces to try and create an authentic, meaningful experience in VR. This is not an experience about being black, to be clear. This is about experiencing white racism from the perspective of a black body. I'll now show you a press clip which gives you little snippets of the experience um, so that you can get a better sense of what this looks like. Look at your reflection in the mirror. Take one step closer and examine your new body. Wave to yourself. You've now become Michael Sterling. Your friends call you Mike. You are six years old and in the first grade. Can you see this block? No, you can have it. What do you make it? I'm making a Minecraft dungeon. Crazy. Are you okay, honey? You want me to call your mother? Just brush it off. Like, I hope you're ready for the game. Please put that in the box. Here. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, what's your name again? It's interviews. Crazy. Glad they're almost over. Is that them? Are they calling about the job? Listen to the voicemail. Hi, Michael. I just wanted to call and thank you for coming in. So, again, just to give you a sense of what this feels like, this is someone who's wearing the headset and we're recording the footage as they're in the headset. Um, we premiered this work at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2018. Uh, and we had these blank walls and had people write on the walls when they came out of the headset. The walls ended up becoming sort of a living document over the course of a couple of weeks. And I just have one snippet that says, harrowing, powerful, out-of-body experience, the inability to choose or change Michael's fate hit home. We need more experiences like this in the VR world. So at the time that I'm developing this work, I had never used virtual reality. Right? I could barely explain to you what that was. I'd never worn a headset. I had some general sense that I might be able to capitalize on this adage of being able to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. In this case, you walk 10 minutes and we're covering the very surface, the tip of the iceberg of what racism is. But we're, are, we are interested in what effect this has on people when they go through this experience. I'm a psychologist by training. I'm interested not only in the emotional response, but I'm interested in whether people think about race and racism differently as a result of having gone through this experience. Our early data analysis suggests that people become more clear about the nature of structural inequities in society just by going through the 10 minutes of the experience. They reach the same point of understanding that people in our control condition who don't do VR but take a class over the course of 14 weeks. So the people in the VR condition reach this point of understanding in 10 minutes that it takes 14 weeks for people using the course. Wow. We're also engaging in transdisciplinary storytelling, right? Stories, when we're using them for the sake of social change and social engagement, um, require data and science, but also artistry and storytelling and skills that are often beyond my reach. Um, so in our new experience that we've created, we've used motion capture uh, uh, 
studios to capture body movement so you have more control of the body, voice recognition, and we're working with a production team who are filmmakers and video game producers. And we work with them very closely. We didn't just hand over a script or we didn't just hand over an idea. We had them interview black people about their experiences growing up with racism. We wanted them to understand the essence and nuance as best as they could as non-black people um, so that they could translate that into their work. And we worked very closely at every point along the way. Calling back to the boys in data visualization, we're also creating a new experience where um, I'm attempting to not only document and understand the existential threats facing black people, but to document the threats themselves, the patterns of threats in society. Can I visualize structural racism in virtual reality? Can I take existing data and models and represent that meaningfully visually in VR? To give you an example, if you're standing on a digital street in Brooklyn, can I allow the user to manipulate time and drag time forwards or backwards and see the physical environment change based on a policy decision, a housing policy, a policing policy, a climate policy, right? If I, if I represent the data we have about stop and frisk practices and you're dragging time forward and you see the black bodies on the street start to become translucent, indicating the ways in which they've been stopped and hit over time, maybe eventually becoming outlines representing their j being jailed or incarceration rates. You start to have a visual sense of how a policy that seems you know, basic to some people, but to those who are experiencing it, it's fundamentally changing the community. It's fundamentally changing those bodies. Can I take the data that's already clear, well documented, and translate that in a way that might be engaged differently, understood differently, understood viscerally, that might translate into a difference in understanding and behavior and engagement. Blackness is technology. Blackness is constructed. It's a tool. We made it up and we use it. Black can be reconstructed and it can be retooled. The work of Andre Black, Brock, who talks about black cyber culture says, Black cyber culture can be understood as the protean nature of black ide identity, mediated by various digital artifacts, services, and practices, both individually and in concern. He talks about the ways in which black people create joy through various technologies, the ways we express our fullest selves on Twitter, black Twitter, the ways in which we're going old school here with Black Planet, although I heard they're coming back. Um, that's my screen name at the bottom, Verve Truth. That was my Black Planet name. <laughs> he talks about the scholars Hoffman and Novak who argued that the problem wasn't literacy or access to these technologies, but getting black folks online required content that was satisfying to their needs. You had to let black people be creators, curators of their experience, not just hand them a platform. And even when you do hand us a platform, we change it and manipulate it to our needs. Tick tock. Black Planet was the, one of the first, first social networking sites and Black Planet centered black users as designers and members. It quickly was overshadowed by things like MySpace, Facebook, etc. But the design and fundamental intent of the platform started with Black Planet. Blackness, according to Brock and others, has already transformed digital spaces and technologies, not designed for it. And blacks have designed and built digital spaces, especially for us. So now I want to shift into thinking about where I'm headed. Afrofuturism, the imagined, being untethered, and the metaverse. Blackness is Afrofuturism. Futuring is a necessary complement to realism. Alondra Nelson says, Afrofuturism has emerged as a term of convenience to describe the analysis, criticism, and cultural production that addresses the intersections between race and technology. Afrofuturism looks across popular culture to find models of expression that transform species of alienation into novel forms of creative potential. In the process, it reclaims theorizing about the future. 
Samuel Delaney says, we need images of tomorrow and our people need them more than most. Without an image of tomorrow, one is trapped by blind history, economics, and politics beyond our control. Only by having clear and vital images of the many alternatives, good and bad, of where one can go, will we have any control over uh, where we may actually get there in reality. Tomorrow will bring this too quickly. I think I messed up the quote, sorry. So I wanted to think about the ways in which black people have leveraged technologies to create a different imagination of the future and where we may go. I'd like to highlight the Neural Speculative Afrofeminism Project from Hyphen Labs. This is a digital narrative that sits at the intersection of product design, virtual reality, and neuroscience. Inspired by the lack of multidimensional representations of black women in technology. The Neurospeculative Afrofeminism Project uh, creates products that range from sunblock for traveling through the multiverse to earrings embedded with cameras that offer protection and visibility from social surveillance. The VR experience is set in a neurocosmetology lab where black women are pioneering techniques for brain optimization and cognitive enhancement. Finally, scientific research exploring the neurological and physiological impact of showing images of empowered black women, as well as content made for and by women of color. These are black women and other women of color imagining how to use technologies that weren't designed for them. They're creating these, pro these products like scarves that obscure your face from cameras that are uh, on the street, um, ways in which to protect your identity and privacy um, anticipating that technologies are being used and launched against us. So they're disrupting these technologies by reimagining, retooling them for their own purposes and use. Just quickly, some of the product, products that they've created. A visor with a dichrotic reflective surface that allows its wearers to see but not be seen. Earrings that function as cameras and recording devices meant to document both micro and macro aggressions in a safe and discreet manner. A silk scarf whose pattern triggers facial recognition software to the point of overwhelming it. If at a protest, for example, hundreds of people who wore the scarf, the cameras would be so triggered by the textiles they would shut the cameras down. The Octavia. Its technology riffs off high definition transcranial direct current stimulation. I don't know what that is. A non invasive brain stimulation technique which uses electrical currents to stimulate regions of the brain. The procedure is currently used to alleviate depression and anxiety in patients, as well as to optimize a user's mind by augmenting memory to increase creativity and workflow. In Hyphen's lab's take, the electrodes are combined with self-cleaning natural hair extensions in order to be weaved into textured or natural hair. Don't let black people start creating. <laughs> so we'll take a little bit of something and create a lot. If you give us, if we take these technologies, what will we imagine, what will we create for our own protection and our own well-being? Blackness is imagined. Imagining a blackness free of white imaginaries. Kevin Quasey, and I have to say, I just discovered this book uh, two days ago, and I've already dug deeply into it, and it's already shaping my thinking. His recent text on black aliveness or a poetics of being thinks about black imaginaries independent of whiteness. An anti-black imaginary presumes to have nullified the question how to be. Since we are either whatever the world says we are, or we are enmeshed in refusing that imposition. Of course, acquiescence is intolerable. And though defiance is essential, it is not sufficient. We are more than our fight against white oppression. And when we are not fighting white oppression, what are we? What would it mean to consider black aliveness, especially given how readily and literally blackness is indexed to death? To behold such aliveness, we have to imagine a black world. We have to imagine a black world so as to surpass the everywhere and every day of black death, a blackness that is understood only through such a vocabulary. 
This equation of blackness and death is indisputable and enduring, surely. But if we try to conceptualize aliveness, we have to begin somewhere else. If we're imagining black futures, we can't stay rooted in black death and oppression. We are not the idea of us. We are not even the idea that we hold of us. We are just us, multiple and varied, becoming. The heterogeneity of us, blackness in a, wor in a black world is everything, which means it gets to be freed from being any one thing. We don't live in a black world, this is true, but the, but the as if of such imagining that literature offers, that as if can inspire how we might navigate the world we indeed live in, the one that is anti-black and that resists and resents and despises our being. We don't live in a black world, but in a poem, in an essay, there's an orientation of such being waiting for us. And so in some ways, I offer these, poem in our, these poems in our hands as a world of an invitation of how to try to be. This is, this is black aliveness. So Kwesi is talking about not only do we have to grapple with the existential threats of white racial oppression, and that that is a reality that we have to navigate. Imagining black futures and what we want and how we exist beyond that narrative is an important part of our survival. In order to survive reality, we have to imagine the future. And that, mag that imagining can't be rooted only in black death and torment. Who else are we aside from white imaginaries? Ruha Benjamin on race after technology. That imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies. If we don't imagine, who's doing it for us? Whose imagination and reality are we living in? And when we stay tethered to whiteness, if we stay tethered only to our fight against whiteness, are we truly living in a black imaginary? Can we truly imagine a black future that's rooted and steeped in independence and freedom? Remember to imagine and craft the worlds you cannot live without, just as you dismantle the ones you cannot live within. Blackness is untethered. Notions of blackness do not exist because of, in spite of, in response to whiteness in any way. To be untethered is a black existence that is being free, unencumbered, unencumbered to examine a full range of humanity. Can we practice freedom together? Can we remember what it is to be alive with each other beyond suffering and survival? Black women, I would argue, exist in this untethered state. We are alive and exist between categories. We are floating between norms. And this might be an important focal point for examining and understanding the concept of being untethered. Indeed, black feminism has been a critical resource for examining black futures, Afrofuturism, et cetera. Blackness in the metaverse. An emerging digital and transphysical ecosystem. There's a society that is being actively replicated, translated, and reimagined. How we play, educate ourselves, our financial systems, the way we work, governance, and services already exist in digital spaces and are expanding in ways that are important for us to know about and understand. What is the metaverse? Defined loosely, the metaverse is an all-digital layer of reality that floats above, around, and throughout the features of the real world, or in some definitions, is entirely separate from it. 
the creator of Magic Leap, which is an augmented reality technology, has calls this the magic verse. A merged system of systems bridging the physical with the digital in a large scale, persistent manner within a community of people. So let me describe this in a couple of ways. You have this physical room, and then we have things like augmented reality, where you could hold up your phone or an iPad and overlay digital information. Uh, the demographic makeup of people in this room, the zip codes of people in this room, the history of how this building was built and who built it and who uh, have been the last 10 speakers to speak in this room could be presented as digital information. So I could still see you and I maybe could see information over the top of your head through this screen, right? That's giving me information about you or this room. So that's one layer. Virtual reality, what I just showed you, where you're becoming an avatar, you're controlling a body in a digital space. There are spaces where you can interact in real time, meet people, shake hands, have a barbecue, have a meeting, right? Those virtual spaces exist. So the metaverse is talking about the increasing collective combination and intersection of those systems. The ways in which what's physical will increasingly become digital. So I would describe this as replicas, translations, reimaginings of the physical world. So thinking about if I want to take this physical room and translate it in some way as a digital space. I want to recreate this conference room. And now we won't have lectures in person. We'll meet in a digital environment as avatars and an exact replica of this space. Or we can think about transphysical forms thinking about, again, how I can connect the physical to the digital in digital spaces at various levels. And we should be thinking about, and people certainly are, complete reimaginings of our world, societies, and communities and ways of being. Facebook would love it if you were in a digital space all the time that they owned. And they just invested $10 billion to create this space. So it's coming, not here, but we should probably be aware about it, be aware of it. The metaverse does not exist, it is becoming. It is being actively created, not by people who look like me, mostly not by people who look like you, but mostly by big tech companies who are invested in controlling the new future. What can it be? So people have started thinking about what is the metaverse and what might it be? Persistent, continues indefinitely, never resets or pauses. It's not like a video game. It continues whether you're logged on or not. Some of you are like that with Instagram and Twitter, right? they're always on there. Synchronous and live, a living experience that exists consistently. Limitless participation. There's no limit to the number of people who can be in the metaverse at a given time. Everyone, anytime, at the same time, with complete individual agency. You control what you do, how you look, what you say, etc. A fully functioning economy where you can create, own, invest, sell, and work. So this will, again, this is an example of transphysical. Our economy in the physical world will continue, and there's a digital economy that's already there, right, that will continue to expand. Digital and physical, private and public, open and closed platforms. There will be spaces owned by Facebook, and there will be spaces that you can create on your own because the tools will exist for you to create your own spaces in the metaverse. Interoperability, meaning that your digital items and assets that you own will function across platforms and spaces. It's meant to be an open, democratic space. Created and operated by a wide range of contributors. Will it be user driven in addition to organizations? Open for anyone and controlled by no one. Hardware independent. It doesn't matter if it's iPhone or Android, it shouldn't matter, right? The metaverse should be open. Decentralized, democratic, and free. Equitable, safe, and fair. Multi sensory. It's not just what you'll see. It's what you'll be able to touch and feel, smell and hear. Sentient, the artificial intelligence and the way that we'll use data to create new beings 
and how they live and exist in digital forms and digital spaces. What is it now? I've just described virtual reality, our social media platforms, the ways in which we might create avatar, digital representations of ourselves, augmented reality, and the ways in which we use our devices to overlay digital information. Right now, those are all separate and don't hold to any of the criteria I just used on the previous slide. But this is where we're moving, where these systems will be integrated um, and become a, a, a um, intersecting ecosystem that will be important for us to understand. I just wanted to share this slide. So uh, the creators of Fortnite, don't know if any of you are gamers, uh, Unreal, have this new technology that allows you to create metahumans. These are not real people. These are digital images that were created within seconds and can be ma manipulated quickly. I wasn't able to embed the video to show you, but if you're interested, I encourage you to look at it. They can speak and talk. So when I talk about artificial intelligence and beings becoming sentient, They'll look like this and they'll be able to talk to you. Who are you talking to and interacting with in the metaverse and in digital spaces? So there's a big tech presence. The companies that control our technology now are rapidly moving into this space uh, and using data, all the data that's available that we provide and give to people through our devices, et cetera, to shape what this metaverse will be. So there are people on one side who are holding this ideal. It should be free and open and democratic. It should promote equity and justice. It should be for everyone. It shouldn't be controlled by anyone. And on the other side, the people who already control our technologies are rapidly moving to create and design the space. So the case for a black metaverse. Lisa Nakamura on being the other. The corporate image factory needs images of the other in order to depict its product. A technological utopia of difference. It is not, however, a utopia for the other, or one that includes it in any meaningful or progressive way. Rather, in purpose, rather it purposes an ideal world of virtual, social, and cultural reality based on specific methods of othering. So even on this slide where you have these diverse individuals, black and brown people being represented. Nakamura would argue that technologies are deliberately racialized, using the other as a tool, but not in ways that meaningfully integrate them or their experiences. So you will be there in the way that other people chose to represent you. Technologies are inevitably racialized, even as they claim to be raceless. People love to be colorblind. It helps them ignore racism. There is no raceless technological progress. Everything that's happening, everything that I talked about in terms of where I've been and where I'm going, all those systems of racism and oppression are being translated into this new digital space, especially if we don't intervene and create our own spaces. I come back to Kwasi. We are not the idea of us. We are not even the idea that we hold of us. We are just us, multiple and varied, becoming. The heterogeneity of us, blackness in a black world is everything, which means it gets to be freed from being any one thing. We don't live in a black world, this is true, but the as if of such imagining that literature offers, and I'm arguing the black metaverse may offer, that as if can inspire how we might navigate the world that we indeed live in, the one that is anti-blackness and that resists and resents and despises our being. We don't live in a black world, but in a poem, in an essay, there's an orientation of such being waiting for us. And so in some ways, I offer these poems in our hands as a world of an invitation of how to try to be. That is black aliveness. What I'm arguing is that this new digital frontier is open now. Where do we stand? How do we use it? We, we're not at the point where we have the luxury to completely reject these technologies outright, right? We might say, I'm better off outside the metaverse. I have no interest in being a digital avatar, talking to someone who I don't know is AI or a real person or not. I get you. And it's coming anyway. 
So what do we do with that? And in these spaces of thinking about these notions of Afrofuturism, these notions of black imaginings and black futures, this is a landscape, this is a frontier that's open and undefined. Maybe if we take control of it in some way, we have some options for creating these new futures and these new black imaginings, these spaces of black freedom. Because if we don't, they will be created for us and there will be a replication of where we already live and exist. So this notion of being untethered, being uh, black free of whiteness in responses to whiteness, in resistance to whiteness, in proving how magic and joyful we are in the face of whiteness. Is there a version of blackness and black imaginings and black futures that exist independent of whiteness? This potentially is a space where that's possible. Can we and should we use the notions of black imagination, black aliveness, Afrofuturism, the cautions, hopes, and audacious joy observed within critical race and digital studies? Can they be applied to the possibilities of building black worlds in the black metaverse? Is the metaverse a frontier for immersing blackness in our black skin, black joy, black vision, black quiet, black worlds, black leisure, black aliveness, black legacies, black mystery, black imagination, black abstracts, black space? Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. happy to take questions. Okay. It's a lot of information, yeah. not only black pain, right? Blackness exists outside of whiteness in the physical world as well, but the argument is that so much of our existence is a, a declaration of our joy for other white people to see and understand. Black girl magic wouldn't have to be said if it weren't for white racism, right? We wouldn't even need to claim it publicly. But our joy still exists independent of that. And so what I'm arguing is that in the metaverse, you have private spaces, right, that you can create. Can we create safe walls within this digital space that allow us to explore and imagine these new realities? We'll still have to live in the physical world. We'll still exist in this reality. But if we don't create it, it's going to be created for us. We'll be joining the, the metaverse equivalent of Twitter, right? We'll be joining the metaverse equivalent of Facebook rather than the metaverse equivalent of Black Planet. Right? So maybe we need to think about creating those spaces. And then once you're there, the possibilities are pretty limitless, right? What you create and what you do and how you dance and how you create joy, how you build black spaces, you have a blank canvas. And I've come to this recently, right? There's, there's all this emphasis on anti-racism. I work deeply in that work as well. And I had someone ask me, what do we put in its place? And I didn't have a clear answer. I've spent my whole career trying to convince people racism is real, right? I'm, I've spent my whole career trying to convince people that this matters and that we all share in this fight. 
We don't have equal responsibilities, though, or accountability, but that's a separate conversation. What else is there? I have to move beyond. So when I'm, when I'm saying I'm starting at this place of thinking and imagining, I'm rooting myself in this work that's inspiring me and sharing it with you, what else is there than fighting white racism in the intermittent moments of joy in spite of it? No, no. I'm terrible at math. Yeah. No, so math and math and science are clearly important, right? STEM education is important, but so is art, so is poetry, so is literature. The most deeply informed beings I've encountered as I've done this thinking are uh, writers and poets who understand nuance and richness uh, in ways that a scientist may never really tap into. So if we want it to be rich and not just technical, we need people who aren't interested in the technical part at all, but who are engaging anyway, which is how I would define myself. Right? So yes, that's skills that involve science, uh, math, technologies, et cetera, but it's, it's a range of ways of understanding, valuing a range of knowledge um, that's needed to build these kinds of spaces and experiences. Thank you so much. Um, former preschool teacher. <laughs> Did your um, childhood meta explorations have the, any connections to your adulthood work right now? I'm sure, yes, yes. Do you want me to elaborate on that? Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah, so I grew up uh, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, I, my family's from this town called Arcadia. Uh, which is a black town outside of Oklahoma. My cousin was the mayor. We shared this when I was hungry last night. Um, you know, my, my uncle owned a lot of land. So I grew up in a, this distinctly black space inside of Oklahoma. The most distinct memories I have of racism came when I went to the University of Virginia, which is striking, right? I grew up in Oklahoma, but I grew up insulated in this sort of black space with this big black family. Um, in this black town uh, in ways that insulated me. So that's my, you know, that's my entire childhood. So I think that's an important reference I have, right, for imagining what it feels like to be free. I was trained to be black, but I didn't have to think about it that much growing up, right? It wasn't until I left that bubble that it really started to hit me upside the head, right? So yeah, I think it's fundamental who we are and how we've been raised and lived uh, shapes everything that we do. Oh yeah, so um, I don't know, I have the feeling that you maybe have heard this comment <laughs> before, okay. uh -huh. so, uh, but I'm gonna uh, say it anyway, okay. or ask it anyway, because I guess it's kind of like, <sighs> a worry or your thought press process concerning this worry when you were developing the virtual reality, mm -hmm. you know. And I was thinking of, you know, Sadia Hartman's Scenes of Subjection. And she's talking about, you know, the sort of voyeuristic w impulse of the white haze that, like, created white subjectivity in relation to, like, commodified enslaved people. Yeah. And so, you know, I guess the worry is, you know, what she's doing, among other things, in that work is like saying, you know, that was bullshit. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was your imagination, like, that did create your subjectivities over time, but um, you never really did that, of course. I mean, among other things, right? Yeah. Um, is to sever, you know, that the, the gaze from um, its imaginaries based on, uh, you know, black flesh. So I guess, the worry of the VR is like, I don't know, I just imagine someone saying, oh, I did feel, <laughs> I did experience what it's like to be black, now I know, that was a you know, really hard experience, but I'm happy I made it through, but of I'm course they, have white, they were white the whole time, right? Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, I guess that's the worry, and what your thoughts are, 
for your um, warnings that you might give people before yep. uh, experiencing it. Yep. So I'm black. I share that worry, right? That people would come out of this head saying, headset saying, I know exactly what it's like to be a black man. And thank God no one has ever said that to me. They may have thought it, but they didn't say it out loud. Um, but it is a concern, right? This is not a costo. This is not a game. This is not something you take on and take off in the way that you might uh, wear an offensive Halloween costume. And so that was at the forefront of our thinking related to this. So here's a couple of things that we did that I think helped us avoid that space. And this would be the warning to other people. One, the people sitting at the table creating the experience are representing narratives that are their own. They're not uh, speculating, they're not uh, imagining too far outside of their own experience. That and the diversity of that group and those experiences I think changed the ways in which we represented uh, the narrative and the types of things that happened in the experience. Our orientation that again this was not about being black, this was not about putting on blackness, this was about experiencing white racism. That orientation changes what gets represented in the experience and what shows up. It's hard to get a sense of it showing you on video here, but whiteness was centered in everything. So much so, in fact, that people, instead of telling me that I feel like I know what it's like to be black, consistently tell me that I felt more white than ever. That they're stepping into this body, but they are gaining this consciousness around their own whiteness because the experience is such a contrast to what they're going through. I'm, I'm guessing, I haven't measured this yet or studied this yet, that in some ways are making whiteness more salient, which is not something I explicitly designed for, that we explicitly designed for, but I think it's a, it's a marker of what we've gone through in terms of the process. It could have gone the other way, right? We have no idea. Like I said, I barely understood the technology at the time. Um, I think we hit a mark that's useful and productive. But, Black women have been the most critical of the work, right? Is this racism porn? Are we using black pain and trauma to educate white people? Yeah, we are, right? We are. How do we teach people and learn, help them learn about the realities of racism when these other methods, they have been so psychologically resistant to? Is there something else we need to try? Because they do need to understand it. So when we did a pilot study with just black people, we gave them the option to go through the VR, watch it on a screen, or just read the transcript, um, and then just talk with us after about how they were feeling. Should we be doing this? What do you think about this, et cetera? Consistently, people told us that they were glad they didn't have to use their own stories anymore. They didn't have to use their own pain and trauma to educate pe white people about these realities. So we're still, Given all of that, we're still in murky territory, right? Ethical territory. You're stepping into a black body. You're walking around in a black body. You don't control that body. You don't perform in that body. You don't speak as that body. So there's certain elements of the experience that I think prevent this notion that I have become this person and I now understand this in a way. In fact, the more common reaction is, I thought I understood this, but I don't. That's the mark. But, but I don't have a complete understanding of why we seem to be in that territory and not in the, I know what it's like to be a black man, right? So all I can speak to is our process and what we try to do, but it's not like I have a prescription to, to tell people how to avoid this. So what I do instead is don't tell stories that are not yours, especially when it relates to this attempt to kind of have positive social impact on the world. You cannot interpret blackness for me. And to think about what the person is doing when they're in that body and who's on the team creating these experiences. Those are the little bits of information I have about how to, how to not be in this territory. But it's still, it's still tricky, a tricky space to be in. So this is really, um Amazing. I don't even know what to, to think because it's so forward and, um, and I don't have the right language. But, you know, since it's the Constance E. Clayton lecture, I want to just convey a, a, a conversation that 
I've had with Dr. Clayton and, and some of her other friends here, and, and this may not even be the right scientific language, but I know as we talked to Connie about helping students, young people in the future, she often asked me, well, what about, what do you know, and who can we get who understands artificial intelligence? And I realized this isn't, I mean, this is our avatars and it's real and this metaverse is something that I can't even <laughs> understand, but I think what one of the things that comes to mind from this conversation and from your lecture and from Connie's um, forward-thinking question is, you know, where are we as people of color? Where are we as black folk in making this happen? Where are we in this world? And if we don't become part of it, just like everything else, it's going to be defined for us and we're just going to be holding on to the remnant if we want to be part of that. And so I guess my question really is, you know, what, you know, where is our representation? What, what does it look like from your vantage point of black folk, people of color, in this work? Because Connie's question is really so forward thinking, you know, what can we do to get our young people involved in this? And so just, you know, and, I, and the rest of it, the metaphor, I'm working on it. I'm okay. working on it. Okay, yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> Well, there's two pieces, right? We've always been here, and that was part of the argument, that even when we inherit technologies, we redesign them, reimagine them, retool them, transform them to our needs. So it's not that we are passive, uninformed users um, and creators of technology. We're here. Um, the issue with the metaverse is that uh, are we, do we, well, two things. One, do we understand the technologies well enough to disrupt them? Right? So you have to understand it so you're not consumed, defined, and controlled by it. Right? So the scarves and the earrings are disruptions using technology. Right? So one way to disrupt potentially is to go off the grid, right? not be engaged at all. If that's not the choice, then how are you going to use technologies to your advantage, benefit, protection of the people you care about? So that's one level. And we do that already, and we can continue doing that. Who has the resources to control and build the metaverse, though, is another thing altogether. $10 billion from Facebook is the beginning of what they're going to invest in making this happen. So, and you can think about Facebook has already been doing it, right? Facebook is not just Facebook. Facebook is Instagram and WhatsApp, and they own uh, the virtual reality technology I use, Oculus, right? They're already in this space. So, we have to figure out a way, one, to hold those companies accountable for who's designing it, right? Even if I don't have $10 billion to make my own metaverse, who's at the table creating the bones of this, the, the, the built experiences that come out of organizations, who's making sure that it stays open so that we can even teach our kids to create their own spaces in, in the metaverse. So that starts right now, right? That starts with holding the people who are gonna build the infrastructure for this holding them accountable at the very outset. Who's at the table? Who's involved in the, in the design? So you're also saying we have to learn about the technologies as we are. We, we have to learn about the technologies um, even if we don't want to use it. We still need to understand it, right? Let me give you an example. Virtual reality is tracking your whole body. Every shoulder move movement becomes a data point your physical body then becomes essentially a fingerprint. You can be identified just based on your physical movements as soon as you walk into a room. So do we want to passively introduce VR into our classrooms without understanding the consequences of that or how that data gets used? People can be accurately identified as being schizophrenic or having an anxiety disorder just based on their movements in VR. That's how precise and nuanced it is. There's you know, millions of data points on your body being tracked. We have to understand that. We have to know that, right? And whether I want to be in it or not is a separate question, but we have to understand that it's here, it's expanding, and being controlled by the same forces that we're mad about because of what they did on Facebook. And with our data over here and our data over there, it's the same people. So yes, there's a responsibility for us to understand it. We've just created a new minor at the School of Social Work and Emerging Societies and Tech minor where we're teaching social workers, we need you to know what it is. We need you to know what's there. We need you to know how ankle monitors are being used. 
We need you to understand this. We need you to understand. You think ankle monitors and sending you home is a good thing? It's not, right? So we need to process and understand so we can disrupt it or use it to our benefit or in reimagining ways it could be used like the neural speculative Afrofeminism piece. That's what happens when you put the technology in the hands of black women. What do we make then? So I'm asking, what do we, not only do we understand the technologies, are we going to disrupt it? How are we going to use it? But how will we imagine our lives and our worlds? Maybe there's new possibilities in, spa in these spaces, while not being naive about the, the downsides, right, and how they're replications of our current society. In my mind, I'm going back to Wakanda forever. It's like, Wakanda. This, is, this is like reality. Yeah. Um, but the virtual reality um, work that you're doing, have you thought of or have you included biofeedback? So measuring blood pressure, body temperature, things like that. And how is that incorporated in, in the work? Yeah, we wanted to do that at the, at the outset, because in part I'm, I'm a stress researcher, so I was interested in how it would feel to people going through the experience, not just how they told me they felt. Um, but it got complicated with measuring those things reliably while you're in the headset and moving up and, up and down, et cetera. Um, but there's a new headset from HP um, called the Omni Reverb, Omnicept Reverb, which tracks, well, this is dangerous and powerful, right? That's the case with most technologies. That has eye tracking built into the headset, which is already true for your basic headset. Um, it has a ton of biofeedback data as well, so your blood pressure, your heart rate, etc. So think about the ways in which that could be a good thing, right? That you're stressed and you're trying to regulate your anxiety, and being in this headset, maybe in a meditation, might help you be more aware and able to emotionally regulate in the face of stress and to try that out and experience that. Um, you could also imagine how that data could be misused, that I'm in a meeting, uh, participating in a work meeting in virtual reality, and I seem stressed out and anxious, and my boss thinks I can't cut it, and they get that data and use that data, and that data may go on some sort of permanent digital record that gets, then goes to my next employer. Or a kid, right, who's uh, having attention issues in class, and that data's being tracked and then goes on some part of a school record, right? So. Those are the things we have to anticipate and think about, I think, while also thinking about how they can be powerful and leveraged and meaningful and magical and dangerous and harmful and exacerbate existing oppressions uh, rapidly. Yeah, I'm sitting here like imagining all the different actors and roles necessary to make this true, mm -hmm. rather than be data scientists, engineers, philosophers, yeah. social workers, clinicians. But fear of mine is that the field of law is not going to catch up mm -hmm. with technology and ethics, and it will once again abandon us. It is so far behind. Yeah, so what is your perspective on that? Or are there advocates and vanguards in that field protecting us for that world? Yeah, so it's not an exaggeration to say that this is the Wild West. Right? So even just virtual reality is the wild west. There's no regulation over what you could create or do in virtual reality. I just showed you how realistic, that was on my budget, right? How realistic that can look and feel. Imagine, right? So it's dangerous and there's no federal regulation. They don't understand the technologies themselves. So even when they go to testify, it's not clear to me that Congress even understands what they're saying and what the implications are. So law is, is a frontier that needs to show up. So individual lawyers are showing up, right? There are groups of people who are thinking very carefully about data privacy and ethics and justice as it relates to these technologies, coming up with manifestos about this is what we should do, this is how we protect data, this is how we protect users, here's what we should and shouldn't do with these technologies. But these are just like grassroots efforts, right? Off the grid, it's, it's not regulated or organized at a governmental level in any way. So it's like, you know, scouts honor right now. That's scary. Do we have time for one more question, maybe? All right, Sean? Yes. Thank you for your hand, Dr. Cogburn. So I've been, I've been sitting and reflecting really just 
just internalizing, you know, everything that was presented. Um, and I, I think you spoke a lot on how um, uh, this, these technologies and these concepts can be used as like educational tools, you know, um, imagining blackness untethered from whiteness, dispelling, dispelling myths of, um, you know, uh, the black monolith and all these things. So um, I definitely, you know, see this as being a very powerful educational tool. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you've given any thought to the potential impact that this technology may have on um, healing, like healing from trauma. Um, I was thinking about how um, nowadays pretty much the top movies, the top TV shows are based in either fantasy or superpowers or like um, romanticizing, you know, um, the days of old to escape from you know, reality. And most of the minds that are involved in you know, creating this content are individuals who were like ostracized, be it from racism or you know other things. And so I'm just wondering if much thought has been given to um, not just using this as an educational tool, but um, the possibilities that we're imagining in the black metaverse um, being a way to translate what's you know in the um, in the digital yeah. to the real to to help you know individuals heal from trauma. Absolutely, and it's it, you know it's already being used in those ways. So VR is being used uh, to treat uh, PTSD um, and putting people in situations that are challenging for them, and you can sort of gradually elevate it. Right? And so uh, meditation, right? Imagining clear, clean spaces, calm, peaceful, etc. Uh, there are pieces that use movement and dance. So there's one piece I tried out in um, Amsterdam where you're dancing with a figure and when you get the movements right, the, the environment becomes more beautiful, right? Flowers start to bloom, the sun starts to come out, right? So the, there's so much beauty, right? There's so much possibility. Um, but I haven't specifically conceptualized work around black healing, although other as in VR, although other aspects of my work um, is situated in that space. But I did teach a class in the spring. I taught a class in virtual reality. So I sent headsets to 20 students around the country and we showed up as avatars every day to, to class. Um, and these are social workers. And I had them imagine, one, do you understand the technologies? The first six weeks were spent on the risks and pitfalls and the dangers and you should be scared. Okay, and then we're like, given that, how do you disrupt, use, or engage the technology given your understanding of that? And they went there, right? They're, these are clinical social workers, activists, community organizers, etc. They thought very carefully about black healing. And one of the things that came up um, was, was two that I'm gonna point out. One is black joy, representing black joy in virtual reality. The feeling of being in a barber shop or a homecoming or a barbecue in the backyard. How can you replicate the sensory experience of that in ways that can be powerful and healing, that can be an escape in some ways? Um, while also raising concerns about do we escape too much into these spaces because I've created this beautiful world in here and you know dealing with reality over there. Another was a, a project developed by a group of Chinese students who were thinking about the legacy of a sex worker who was killed by the police. And yes, it was about that trauma, but it was also, there's a moment where the woman was being chased by the police and she jumped out of a four-story window. She was trying to get away and she didn't make it. In the VR, as she jumps from the window, they have you turn into a butterfly and go back to her home in China and follow her whole life trajectory over again. So now I'm situating myself in this complex, rich narrative. I'm not only a sex worker jumping out of a window. How did I get there? I didn't start there, right? So they're using VR to create this beautiful, rich representation of this life trajectory. Um, and then imagining, for whom do I create this? What is the purpose of this? Who's my audience, et cetera? So yeah, I think there's lots of possibility for, for healing. Um, and I hope more clinicians, black people, other folks get into this space. You don't need the technical skills. Um, you, it's just about the right kinds of collaborations. Um, but even if you don't create in this space or use in this space, I urge you to pay attention to news, right? We talk about AI, we talk about uh, big data, talk, think about virtual reality and the metaverse and start reading in that space as well so that you're familiar and aware 
uh, about what's going on because it's increasingly encroaching um, on our lives and we need to be uh, aware. Thank you, everyone. just loves her to death. So anyway, thank you all. Uh, City Love is going to finish up. We have a reception in Woodlands. Is that right, Rhonda? Yes, we So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next year. <laughs>